Christoph Reinhardt, and it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you all on behalf of the Department of Architecture at MIT. Starting off, I want to acknowledge MIT acknowledges indigenous peoples um, as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit here is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of the genocide and forced occupation of their territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather from time immortal. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Uh, this lecture is hosted by the Building Technology Group within the Department of Architecture uh, to review the many accomplishments of Marilyn Anderson would take books to fill and write. We don't have the time for that. I'm also not a huge fan of uh, reading long um, CVs and bios, so I just want to um, talk about the highlights of the highlights and then uh, celebrate some of the moments where um, uh, Marilyn has touched uh, our community uh, since she has been and still is a member of the BT community. So what you should all know is uh, Marilyn is a full professor at Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland, where she heads a group called Lippet that works on all things daylighting. And she brings this research into the world as well to, uh, through a consulting firm that she uh, co-founded with two of her former students um, called Oculite. If you want very detailed, um, uh, fabulous consulting advice on your daylighting projects. He is a person to talk to. Um, her work has also been rewarded with many awards, most notably the 2016 Research um, Daylight Research Award from the Velox Foundation. Uh, when Marilyn left MIT, uh, she shortly afterwards became Dean of the School of Architecture and Civil Engineering at EFBFL, and I would say they're one of her most notable leadership uh, Accomplishments that I'm aware of is the 2017 US Solar Decathlon, which EPFL won that year. That's the big decathlon uh, in Washington, DC. Um, as I said earlier, she also was a member of our community here. So a few things worth remembering. Uh, I think one of the greater accomplishments from uh, Marilyn was these are the early 2000s, and now no student here could imagine not using Rhino and combining it with environmental performance tools for structure, for daylighting and energy, and check how their design was working. I would say that was a completely foreign idea at the time, and uh, Marilyn introduced that. At one point, we even co-taught for a few days a class here where nothing worked uh, for the first two days, but I think uh, it kind of started to set the standards here that MIT tries to use these tools in design. And from the get-go, what was really beautiful, we had, as we have today, students and members from Sasaki here as well. So I would say Marilyn started this tradition that we are still following through today. And then a little thing, if you are wondering, the aisles of MIT, there's actually one room here uh, in the BT suite uh, it's often locked, but we can open it for you, where a skylight has been equipped with a fabulous diffuse daylighting capturing device that brings in the light. Uh, and as you might have guessed, that was Marilyn's old office since she uh, wanted to uh, execute on her daylighting ideas and since she didn't want to sit in the dark. I heard that uh, some of the building permits required for these installations are still in the making today, uh, but uh, if you want to uh, see that installation, it's fant uh, fabulous, and we are happy to show you afterwards. Um, with that, I'm really excited to hear about your more recent work on daylighting and other related fields. Please help me welcome Marilyn to MI back to MIT. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Christoph, for this introduction, and th thank you, everyone, for being here tonight with us, indeed, to talk about light or daylight and what we have been up to in the lab in the last few years since I reluctantly left MIT, which is something that nobody ever does, um, but family called back. So, um, why do we care about daylight? Well, uh, when we see an image like this, which 
shows how much it was celebrated to get rid of daylight in a way and to celebrate instead the fact that we can, with technology, really control everything about an environment. We can control the lighting, we can control the temperature thanks to air conditioning. So the combined invention of air conditioning and electric lighting led to things like this. A windowless building, some of my MIT PhD students actually studied in windowless schools. They still survived, they even made it to MIT, so it looks like it doesn't absolutely kill you, but still it leaves some, <laughs> some traces. And, um, and I think we fortunately had an energy crisis in the 70s, and then uh, we came back to our senses, uh, we started to realize that sanatoria needed sunlight, that we needed this connection to the outside, etc., etc. Or did we? Because in the same journal, New York Times, in 2021, we have this other building that also gets entirely rid of the connection to the outside by being 94% windowless as a dorm uh, in uh, UCSB. So uh, this creates a lot of controversy, fortunately, and hopefully this will never get built. Uh, just for those who uh, wonder, this is not a photograph, but a rendering. But uh, so it looks like we are not totally past the stage where we feel that technology can just fix things for us and that this variable environment under which we evolved maybe is just too difficult to cope with. But maybe we can also uh, dismiss this as not really being architecture. So then let's take another project that is actually led by very established architects, amongst which Pritzker, <laughs> Pritzker Prize winners, the line, which uh, if you represent it, I mean, we could talk about urbanistic qualities, but that's not my field. So if we just stick to light, we realize that there again, it is a celebration of technology which can solve it all. And having a 500 meter high canyon, 500 meter high, so this is like the Sears Tower in Chicago, 200 meter deep building or city is something that we can afford because technology can solve it. Actually, I don't think, at least I agree with that. I think daylight especially is an experience. It's not just having enough light to do what we are supposed to do. You recognize this wonderful place. This is a place where we can really see how much daylight is an experience, changes with time, connects us to weather, connects us to season. And this variability, this very change that we try to avoid by resorting to windowless buildings or, or too much technology is what we should instead celebrate and embrace as the, the conditions under which we evolved as human beings. And this is really at the core of the research that I've been um, doing in the past few, few years, which is to look at how this variability kind of makes it all the way to us. So of course we start with the outside, that are dynamic, we know that, but we shouldn't represent daylight as a yellow sun disk that is only there at noon at the solstice and equinox, but actually as, of course, a very predictable but variable sun course combined with a less predictable and still very variable cloud cover. And it's the two together, not just the sun disk at <laughs> solstice noon, that matters. And I want to insist on the importance of the sky vault beyond the sun, because this too is what gives us the light. That gives us the light at all times, whether it's sunny or cloudy, it does, and has this variability embedded in it as well, which is also something to celebrate. So this is the outside. Now then we have the architecture as the filter, the filter between the outside and the inside. And so you can see that depending on how you filter it, if we reduce architecture to a filter, we just, just bear with me for a little while, then we can create all this variety of ambiences inside, from the Institut du Monde Arabe by Jean Nouvel, which this very highly contrasted small little patterns to very strong uh, sunlight pouring in, or when it's cloudy, then not sunlight only, but this, the vault, uh, the, the uh, light from the vault, Zolverain School of Management, which is the one that I used in this model, but also these other uh, places where we either have very subdued uniform light, where we have uh, places where light comes only from one side, but that's also part of the experience. So all of these different ways in which to uh, get 
this variability through the inside by controlling in a certain, uh, with a certain intent and in a certain way. And then the reason we build building in the first place, which is for occupants, otherwise why, why do it? That means we really have to care about what, what they perceive. And the perception will be diff very different from whether it's sunny or cloudy. And really this is a perspective that I think should be put uh, forward, uh, almost put first. And so in a way, if we think about a, a space like this one, uh, which is the, the Student Learning Center by Snohetta in, in Toronto, we can see that in a, this very uh, generously daylit space, we can also start to imagine what it would be to talk about light beyond just brightness. And therefore, if you have a sunny condition compared to a cloudy condition in simulation, you can start to get interested in other dimensions of daylight than simply the amount of light or the brightness that it brings you. How interesting is what you see and how uh, distributed, wh what is the composition, the choreography of the light? whether it has the potential to make you feel good and, and why. And so these are the types of, the, the type of approach that we try to embrace in uh, the lab. So the lab, as Christoph was mentioning, is called the LIPID, uh, Laboratory of Integrated Performance and Design. And in this lab, we really work at three scales. The human scale, which has become one that we very much focus on. We do a lot of work with, uh, with human subjects. Uh, but actually, this is because it also relates to the building scale and the envelope as this filter or as this way to control the light that the occupants will ultimately get exposed to. And of course, the urban scale as the first uh, fabric through which daylight has to uh, get in and, and, and reach ultimately the occupants. So we have been working at all three scales, and I would say around four main pillars or three uh, dominant pillars that all somehow connect to energy. One of these three pillars is comfort. So comfort is, uh, it should be understood as how acceptable or appropriate a certain uh, lighting condition is to do what you're supposed to do. So do you feel okay, so not uncomfortable? Is there glare that you should avoid? Do you have enough light to do what you need? So this is comfort. The second one uh, is a little less, uh, I would say, mainstream, which is to look also at the more emotional side of things or psychological side of things. How do we perceive light? How does light composition matter, etc. And then the third pillar, which I actually started to work on already while I was at MIT and uh, started to work with the Harvard Medical School on that and with neuroscientists there, is to really look at the physiological impacts of light on human uh, beings through the eyes. And so therefore, all three pillars are three dimensions that are complementary to one another, that they are all talking about something different, but they all talk about light. And so just for you to see what my team looks like, um, just no misunderstanding, the team is, current team is only the middle block. Uh, the other are my alumni, but as you will see, I, I picked a few examples of, of works that also the alumni did. Um, and you can see that the distribution of topics is uh, quite all over the place, but you can also see that the strict, let's say, energy focus has been maybe more in, the, in my an, an alumni group than in the current, which is really these three pillars, which is why I was saying they were dominant. Okay, so let's go through a few examples of what we are doing. So the first one is comfort, and I'm just gonna talk about one uh, piece of work that we have been doing on that, which is maybe a question that, we, uh, that shows how uh, free we are to ask the questions we want, which is what if, the visual environment in which you are could have an effect on the thermal perception you have about it. So what if there was this relationship that we don't expect between what you see and how uh, hot or warm you feel? So this is the question we wanted to ask. That was uh, Georgia Kinazzo's uh, PhD. And I would like to do a little experiment with you uh, going through this very question. So. I'm gonna let you wander around this rainbow pan panorama by Olafur Eliasson in Aarhus, Denmark. And just don't leave the video, it will be a video very short, um, uh, really look at it. But while you're looking at it, pay close attention to your thermal perception, your thermal comfort. Okay, so we are getting started. You're starting to walk around. 
you can see that the color changes a bit, it gets a little more red, you still walk around, you admire the Aorus landscape, then you get to the bluer uh, part of this panorama, you continue to walk, and you're wondering whether you have done the entire, the entire panorama, and you have. So, amongst all of you who looked at or walked around, how many did perceive even the very slightest change in your thermal perception when you changed color? Even slightest. Yes. So in a 10 second experiment, were four years of work. <laughs> True. There is this, uh, we found indeed that there was this, this, this effect. How many of you felt that the red was slightly warmer? And how many thought the blue was slightly warmer? D don't worry, you, it's fine. <laughs> it's statistics. <laughs> Colder in the blue. Yeah, okay, so yeah, indeed that is also what we find, but sometimes there is someone who shows that statistics is statistics and is actually disagreeing. And I had that with a, when I gave a, a lecture to a, what we say in French, a grand public, so a, a large, like for society. And then there was an elderly woman at the back of the room who raised her hand and said, but for me, it was the blue that made me feel warmer. And this is the beauty of statistics is that this is fine because it's only the, we are only talking about the, the overall, the, the, the average or, or a, a Gaussian curve. And so indeed, what we found, first of all, no surprise, we found that when it's cold, people feel cold, and when it's warm, people feel warm. This is already reassuring. But when it's comfortable, then and only then, can you start to see a slight difference. Statistically significant, but small. And indeed, like the room showed, uh, the uh, people tend to feel slightly warmer in the redder environment and slightly cooler in a bluer environment. We also uh, looked at brightness, and there too we found a significant effect. In this case, there was, was not so interesting for comfortable temperatures. These are in degrees Celsius, sorry. Um, but when it was cool, people would slightly prefer a brighter environment. And it, when it was warm, people would slightly prefer a dimmer environment. The, we, we might feel this is natural, but actually when you think of it, it's not so evident. And we actually still are uh, questioning why that was, and one explanation might be that about the um, expectations, that you expect a daylit room to be warmer when it's brighter, and therefore you might want it dimmer when it is warmer. You see what I mean? So that is the, the, the hypothesis that we haven't yet uh, come around to, to demonstrate. So this is a, a small effect, still significant, and could have relevance in, era, in, in, in spaces that are heavily colored, because then you can know something about the expectation of how you might feel thermally in these spaces. You could, but this is pushing it a bit, think about thermostat uh, 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 settings, but uh, I, I would say that the, the, pr the effect is probably too weak to really uh, consider that seriously. So that was an example for the first pillar. For the second pillar, uh, which is emotion and, and, uh, and, and perception, the idea was to not stop at contrast being bad. Because if we just think about contrast, uh, and just think about comfort, sorry, we would uh, immediately consider that glare is something to avoid, and therefore that contrast, which is usually what uh, is at the, the, the source of glare, should be avoided. And yet, no. We, uh, or not only, we also want some contrast. We like contrast, and this is some of the things we like about daylight, is these sunspots, these uh, areas where you really go from quite bright to quite dark, and this is something that we enjoy. And therefore, let's see if we can uh, push this further. And actually, this work did start at MIT uh, with a former SMART student that then came to do her PhD uh, at my lab later on, and the idea there was to look at how we could quantify the amount of contrast in a, in a scene that we would view and really highlight the places where you go from, very, from dark to bright, basically. And then by having a combination of local and global contrast, we can start to quantify this effect and then see if we can uh, qualify or, or describe uh, spaces like the ones that I showed before in a different way in the amount of contrast they would have 
at a given moment of time. So uh, if you have here these different um, uh, spaces or scenes, you can describe them as more or less exciting or calming and also do that over time by using renderings to try to push this to anticipate the, the, their, these kind of perceptual qualities um, over time as well, where you have the year here and the, the time of day here. Pay close attention to this shape. It will come back at some point uh, in, the, in the presentation. So that, now to go beyond just, just contrast, Another PhD called Kintia worked on the patterns. And the idea there was to get inspired by works of architecture around the world that really uses screens as facades and as, a, a, this time, a proper filter to, to daylight. And then, as a scientist, to extract, uh, to get them out of their architecture, so to speak, and get an abstract version of them that could be comparable because they would share the same opening ratio. And then, I mean, I know the architects wouldn't be very happy, but to bring that into a shoebox model so as to get kind of rid of the architecture and just look at the pattern. And so she did uh, uh, several studies that were actually in different places in Europe, but a, a small pilot study that I found very interesting was to look at the difference between these three very simple scenes that all have the exact same opening ratio, 50%. The only difference that they have is that the composition of those openings is slightly different. It's always 50%, but sometimes it's regularly placed, sometimes it's a little more organically placed, and sometimes it's, it's in stripes, something that resembles um, a Venetian blind, which is very common in, in Switzerland. And we used virtual reality to try to test this from a perceptual aspect and ask questions. So you might pick your favorite as well, and then you will see if it's this one. Who picked the middle one as your favorite? Okay, pretty good. Uh, indeed, uh, at least statistically, uh, we ask many questions, but if we say, like, let's say, how interesting is this space, indeed, the, the middle one got the, the highest uh, score. What was maybe more interesting, because not necessarily expected, is that at the same time, we also measured some, uh, we had some biomarkers uh, that were measured, including heart rate variability, skin conductance, and other measures, and heart rate variability did change, or heart rate did change. Uh, here you might think that the heart rate accelerated, actually it decelerated, so for the first image, or the image in the middle, they had a slightly slower uh, heart rate. Um, that shows that either they were more at peace or sort of serene, or that they were just more focused and therefore maybe more intrigued. So this is, again, uh, uh, the, the, the takeaway from, from this experiment is that when you have a perceptual reaction, you might actually also have, in some cases, a physiological reaction that can be measured. And uh, right now we are uh, working with two PhD students. I wanted to show that because one of them is an MIT alumni as well, uh, Stella. And uh, we are working here on views out and not necessarily on trying to give an index to the quality of view, something that I think is almost impossible to do, but more to look into the dynamics of a view. How important is it that a view is a representation of the world that changes with time, rather than just an image of the world that might be static, which is how actually view out research is often being conducted by considering view as a picture of view, but maybe it matters that it's actually not a picture. Or trying to bring in some of the uh, natural features that we love in forests, like sun coming through tree leaves, as being part of a, of a system, maybe a shading system, that could help bring some of the benefits of nature into a facade system. So this is what we are currently working on. We get to the third and uh, last uh, pillar, which is about vitality and about these physiological effects of light. So what is fascinating about this is that this area of research is very recent. Can also only be recent because only 20 years ago was it discovered how exactly light affects us in terms of our physiology and our biology. And how it affects us is through having this regular night-dark cycle under which we evolved, but not, not only us, on, under which the whole living on Earth evolved. And this night-dark cycle, sorry, night-dark, <laughs> bright-dark cycle, or day-night cycle, is actually fundamental 
to our health, to how we live, to how we evolved, and is critical in how we have started to live in, in recent decades or well, since the Industrial Revolution. And as you can see here, the night picture is not quite night, and the day picture this looks like the outside, but actually we spend 90% of our time indoors in a very light deprived environment. So rather than having these highly contrasted bright days, dark nights, we have dim days, bright nights. And this is actually not the conditions under which we evolved and this is actually important also for architecture. So what was discovered that was so special uh, uh, 20 years ago? Wh what was discovered was how we are getting synchronized to the day-night cycle. And the how is through light. Light as the Zeitgeber, as the giver of time. And how does light give us time? Through our eyes. And, and forgive me for a little introduction of biology. Um, it does so by not just allowing us to see through the rods, which is with low light uh, and no color, or the cones, which is for color and bright light, but, and this is the discovery that is quite recent, there is also a sens light sensitive uh, photoreceptor that we have, which is called the IPRGC, intrinsically photo photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, or the melanopsin photopigment. This is the channel or the pathway through which our body responds to light. This was a major discovery because we didn't really, or we, uh, uh, me certainly not, but neuroscientists didn't uh, think that we could have overlooked a photoreceptor in the eye, and yet not only did we, but this is a photoreceptor that is there in the entire living on Earth. It is present, not melanopsin per se, but the sensitive to light doesn't require vision. Sensitivity to light is for bacteria, for fungi, for bees, for most living animals and species. So this is a fundamental receptor, fundamental element of our bi biology that makes us synchronized with the day-night cycle. Now, why do, do we care? Because as light is our giver of time, it is also the one that is uh, managing our clock, our biological clock. This is an expression you probably heard. And this is managing the uh, different hormones, uh, also the body temperature, melatonin, which is probably a hormone you have heard of, right? The night or, or sleep hormone. It needs two conditions to be produced. It needs to be the night and it needs to not have light. So this is something that you cannot force to be produced. If, so the jet lag typically is making the melatonin produced at the wrong time, and the light will stop the melatonin from being produced. So if you go to the bathroom at night, and you, have a, you switch on your light because you can see where you're going, it might not be such a good idea, especially if the light is bright, because then it might tell your body, oh, this is, uh, the night is over, you should stop melatonin production, and then you might have a hard time getting back to sleep. So uh, this is a, a very important aspect. Another important aspect is what the sensitivity range of that photoreceptor is. And it is actually more sensitive to the blue part of the spectrum, to the bluer light. You have probably heard about these blue screens, it's bad for you, you we should avoid the blue and be careful, etc. This is very true, but it's only true at certain moments of the day. It's actually very good to be exposed to blue light in the morning, because then, or light in the morning that has blue, because then it will trigger through that melanopsin the fact that it's the day and this is a good thing. What is not so good is to have that same trigger in the evening when you're supposed to get ready for sleep, get ready to produce melatonin, and therefore you should actually avoid that blue light in the evening. So the screen uh, uh, filters that sem several of you, I'm sure, have installed only use it in the evening. Um, so this has actually effects beyond just scientists telling you that it has effects because this was this discovery. This has effects on mood, on sleep quality, on uh, the immune system, and uh, therefore can have also impacts on how quickly we develop cancer. It has a huge, it's a huge issue for shift, um, shift workers, and, uh, and, and so this is part of the, the, the light hygiene issues that we should really care about. And yet, in cities, rather than having a contrast between day and night, we tend to live further and further from that contrast by 
not only living further inside, but also sometimes further underground. And this is really a, a topic of public health that we should take seriously. So if we try to um, look into how it works, in a nutshell, this is re there are really uh, uh, several things to, to take into account. First of all, what is important to know is that it is much tougher to work with these so-called non-visual effects of light, so the effect of light on us physiologically but not for vision, because it depends on so many things. It not just depends on the intensity of light and the moment, it also depends on the spectrum with a, uh, and, and the blue uh, aspect, but also on the timing, on what you have been exposed to before, and on, on all these uh, sort of dynamics, that, uh, the, how long you have been exposed to it, and so these all matter when we try to find out more about um, the effects of, of light. And then we can consider that it is sort of affecting us in two ways. On one way, in, in, on the one hand, it affects us by us having to accumulate enough light, a, a, a dose that, it, uh, that is large enough over the day to feel like we had that contrast during the day, and on the other hand, at the right time, so as to uh, properly synchronize ourselves with the day-night cycle that we are supposed to be synchronized with. So circadian timing is important and light dose is important, and both of them together can have Im impacts on our health and physiology in, in general. So once we know that, we are curious. So we have neuroscientists that, that a lot of, uh, do a lot of uh, work on, uh, in, in lab studies with uh, sleep-deprived uh, um, subjects that are undergoing very bright light at night and very dark uh, days, and, and we try to figure out what, what, uh, what, what they experience and what the health impacts are, melatonin production at night, but also other physiological responses. In real-life scenarios, this is impossible to control. And so if we want to talk about these effects, we have to be able to measure them, or at least to measure the light we are actually exposed to. I have no idea about your the individual exposure patterns to light. Maybe some of you spend all your time outdoors and therefore have this great contrast between day and night, and some others don't. But until I measure it, I, I don't know. And then I, we also don't know, as an employer, for example, if uh, this cohort of people have the same conditions for, for light depending on where they sit or whatever. So to do that, we have to measure it. And we have to measure it with a spectral resolution, with a resolution that allows us to know what kind of light it is, because this matters on those effects very much. And so we started to develop um, this device called Spectrace that is a wearable device, wearable in the sense that you don't look like ridiculous, um, wearing it, it's, it's, it's okay, I mean, it's, it's not discreet, but still, it's, it's okay to wear, even in social settings, the point being that you want your participants to wear it also in places where they, uh, it's not evident that they are part of an experiment. So, um, so this was a, a quite a large effort also on uh, industrial design, and uh, we have been trying to apply it in different contexts. We currently work with a hospital in, in Geneva with diabetes and shift workers and, and to see how much the, what they're looking at in terms of metabolism and diabetes might also correlate with light uh, exposure. And, um, and we have been also working with um, the University of Reykjavik with these very variable day lengths and then to see how a classroom uh, differentiation in lighting might affect uh, people also in the, in the long run. But how this really works is, okay, if you wear that, or theoretically imagine that you wear that, and then you live your life, like Stefan lived his life in Berlin at some point. While you're doing this, at every moment of time, you, can, you are exposed to a certain spectrum. Uh, so the spectra, oops, oh yeah, the spectra are here. So here you see the color or the characteristics of light. Here you see the, uh, the variation of, or, or the amount of uh, the intensity you have at each wavelength. So this is in the blue region, this is in the red. And so through this uh, graph, you can kind of guess what the distribution of these wavelengths was. And here, this is a graph that shows uh, how different photopic light, so light that you would see, differs from melanopic light, if we want to call it like that, which is light that would be uh, to which the melanopsin photoreceptor would be sensitive. And so if it's 
daylight, it will be the same. And if it uh, uh, has very little blue, then it will be different from daylight, which has a lot of blue. So, OK, so once we have uh, all of these, um, this data, it's already good because we have something about the light exposure over time of this person. But it's not so easy to do anything with it because we have a ton of spectra. We have these maps of how uh, wavelength distribution was varied over time. And we have these two curves that we can see, oh, this was very far from daylight. This was closer to daylight. OK. Uh, so what we started to work on was to try to make sense of this data that we collected. And to make sense of it, we grouped it in clusters using a k-means method. So the idea there was to try to extract a limited number of families of spectra that we can relate to real-world luminaires or types of light. And here we extracted five families. Daylight is in blue, and this is the family of that more or less resembles daylight. You can see that some spectra are clearly not daylight, but it was this is the, uh, the limits of mathematical models. Uh, another family, or th uh, three different families of LED lighting, the three orangey um, uh, yellow ones with different color temperatures, and the one with fluorescent lighting. So with these five families, we can actually already read quite a bit in someone's uh, light diet, or so-called light diet, because then we can replace all this resolution with a, a limited number of families. And we can read a lot of things if we start to look at blocks of time and at their schedule that we can know if we ask them when they were at home, when they were at work. And in this particular experiment, we knew that the, the office was equipped with uh, 3,500 um, Kelvin lighting. So I would say uh, yellowish. Uh, lighting, not very, not very white, not very uh, close to daylight, when they had lunch and when uh, they were commuting or, or stayed after, after work outside of their home. And so once you th do that, you can start to read very interesting things about their life. For example, the fact that they commute outside, maybe by bike, maybe by uh, walking, but they clearly get a good dose of, of daylight in the morning. They also seem to have lunch in a uh, a place with fluorescent lighting. They seem to have had meetings or move in very different uh, areas uh, over time, and then spend also some time after work in a fluorescent lit um, space. And finally, at, in their home, it looks like they have mostly a 3,000 Kelvin type of lighting, and maybe in their bathroom or somewhere they have this other. So we, just by seeing their light, their spectral diet, we, we read a lot, maybe too much, actually. Um, and then if we take an, an, another person with a slightly different uh, uh, schedule, woke up later, still uh, commuted under daylight, uh, what we see here, and you see this line, is the ratio between melanopsin-related and photopic-related. So this, uh, if basically, if you're above one, it's good because that means you're at like daylight or better for the effects that you're looking for on melanopsin. And if you're lower, you're not as good. But what is uh, funny to see here is we can also read, for example, that probably the coffee machine has a 3,000 Kelvin, is in a 3,000 Kelvin space, probably. But we can also compare these two diets and seeing that overall the curve has moved up with a 5,000 Kelvin. Uh, lighting family. And indeed, 5,000 Kelvin is much closer to daylight. Uh, it is much whiter. And yet, we also see that it's not because it's 5,000 Kelvin family that you necessarily have the same efficiency. So I want to also pass the message that it's not just color temperature that matters, but also really the distribution of wavelengths and of intensities in the spectrum. And then you can indeed start to finally extract meaningful stuff either by using models to anticipate what the effects would be on you, on your body, or compare different communities, those that, were, that are working under a static lighting environment that was uh, 3,500, or those that were, in this case, working in a dynamic uh, lighting environment that uh, went up to 6,000 uh, Kelvin. And then you can start to look at differences in groups and, and, and light diets, etc. So what does it have to do with design anyway? Well, in a way, this shows that your light intake will be driven 
both by where you are in general, outside, inside, and also how close to the window and so on. So what the building might offer you as a potential to reach what you need, but also that your behavior in a given space that might be very nicely designed and very nicely lit, depending on how you behave in that space, you might still have very different light exposure patterns. For example, the grad student that I just showed might have reached her healthy dose, this is an illustration, whereas the poor assistant professor going from the coffee machine to her office didn't get the same dose in the same amount of space. So it's really this combination of um, architecture or a building offering you as much as possible, but also you behaving in a way that maybe is more aware of what it might do to you, depending on how you, um, how you behave. And the, the three pillars I've been talking about all, all the time are still here in how we deal with these uh, questions in Oculite Dynamics that was mentioned by Christoph earlier, so still vitality, emotion, and comfort. And here the idea is to bring all this complexity, all these physiological models and, and the perceptual aspects related to contrast and also this uh, dichotomy between comfort and enough light and glare, which is based on whole different types of metrics, into a way that we can talk about space easily with architects and can quite immediately point out at where it works, where it might not, and then, of course, use the same language when we talk about compliance aspects. And this, these three first pillars are usually where most of the interesting discussions happen with architects, with those we, we work, because then you can really engage with them about the experience of light, not just if you have 300 locks or uh, 3,000 foot candles. And no, it's more than that. It's also what the experience is. What, what is the potential of this floor to be conducive to bringing you the health, the, the, the dose of light that you might need? And uh, so these are conversations that usually are very engaging uh, for, for architects and can also lead you to talk about, okay, where it might make more sense to put the workspaces versus the more socializing spaces. And so the, the pink with high contrast would be maybe more conducive to socializing and the blue maybe for work. And, uh, and so all these discussions are really rich to have because you have an easy basis, which is very visual, to get engaged in these quite complex uh, concepts which um, uh, come from research. And in this particular case, we had long discussions about these corner um, areas which have a lot of dynamism over seasons and over time and could be interesting places to, um, to, to, to look at this more, more, more forcefully and kind of make this a, a brand almost uh, of these spaces. So if we think back at the three pillars of sustainability, and I'm very much aware that this is a tiny, tiny, tiny uh, contribution to the topic in a very specific field, but still it does actually happen to address whether it's uh, based on the Brundtland report or the, the more uh, recent um, donut uh, representation, this fact that from a, for people or from a so social perspective, it is also a, a, a question to make sure that we have a good light hygiene and that we look at these different dimensions um, for ourselves. Of course, the environmental component is present as well. We are talking about a renewable source of light and, and one that is present everywhere. But uh, there is also a very strong economic argument because we are talking about public health, we are talking about productivity, satisfaction at work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these different um, aspects are all kind of embedded into um, the, these dimensions that I, this multidimensionality of daylight performance. But before I close, I wanted to uh, switch to a different perspective altogether as to how to raise awareness on these kinds of questions with the public and how to engage uh, more broadly than with a community of scientists or, or, or people really interested, and that is through art. And actually, uh, in the last two years, we have been working uh, very much and with great pleasure on an art exhibition that was open in the spring between March and July and wanted to convey the importance of our light hygiene, our uh, exposure to light and how sensitive we are to it through a different lens, not through science communication, not through papers or even uh, uh, popularization of science, but really through a different perspective, which is an art experience or, or come to an art exhibition. And so this was 
uh, made possible by bringing together four different fields. First, uh, the lead curator was Anna Wirth Justice. She is a professor emeritus from the University of Basel, but she's really the one who brought chronobiology as a field to Switzerland uh, quite a, a while ago. She's 85 by now, I think. Uh, wonderful um, colleague. And uh, so she represented the, the pillar of chronobiology, chronobiology being this science that brings together time and, um, and the living uh, through with a focus on light. I was there, of course, to represent daylighting and also because I work with a lot with chronobiologists and neuroscientists and have been doing that for uh, over 15 years. Um, Sarah Kenderdine was there uh, with experimental museology experience. Uh, she uh, knows what it means to create an exhibition, an art exhibition, and she works with a lot with the virtual world, actually, and with augmented reality on archaeological sites, on many different immersive and experience, uh, experiences to bring the, the, the lens of art through many different topics. And we had also an art historian um, on the curatorial team, Giulia Bini, uh, who also came with a knowledge of contemporary artists. And the four of us together uh, decided to bring together ultimately 19 art pieces that all, one way or another, talk about this uh, the, the sensitivity of the living to, to light. And so the Lighten Up on Biology and Time title really shows that it was this trilogy of light as a giver of time to the living. And to the living can be bees, can be flowers, but can also be sleep patterns, can be um, uh, how you live in a house, the connection you have to the outside, et cetera, et cetera. We had a wonderful artist. This was a, actually a, a, a wonderful experience also uh, for me personally to see how engaged people are. So what was also wonderful was to be able to exhibit in this beautiful uh, EPFL pavilions. This is a, a, a museum uh, building, so to speak, a gallery a space that we have at, on the EPFL campus that was designed by Kengo Kuma. Maybe you see his, you recognize his sensitivity to detail. And um, we had the opening uh, in, uh, in, in March and the, the, the the exhibit was visited by about 7,000 people, and what was very fascinating about it was how personally engaged this brings people to be. They start to wonder about themselves, their own sleep, their own light hygiene, how they behave, how they connect to the outside, how they sleep, and uh, this personal engagement was one of the biggest lessons learned from me was how diversified, we sh in a, how diverse our outreach to society should be, because it's not just by explaining things as scientists that we can get anywhere, but also by engaging people more from a personal standpoint. And I want to just briefly talk about three of these pieces. The first one was by Olafur Eliasson, uh, so we gave him uh, one, of, one of the big <laughs> spaces, of course, Olafur Eliasson. Um, and what was very interesting about his piece, which is mainly this lens that you can see that was slowly rotating, is that it was actually illuminated by the real sun. This was his first oeuvre that was in connection with real uh, daylight. He, he, his, all his oeuvre is almost about light, but in this case it was the real sun with, with a heliostat would come and shine on the lens, and of course when there were clouds, the experience was different, but that was also the point, is to show that we cannot control everything, contrary to the examples I showed at the beginning. Um, so that was one where this really about the connection to the sun and the cycles. Another uh, piece of art I would like to highlight is the, the one by Susan Morris. She had three tapestries, we see two of them, which show how connected we are to the day-night cycle through our activity. And you remember at the beginning of the talk, I told you to pay close attention to these eye-shaped graphs uh, that were light green. You see them again subtly here. This is not a drawing. This is a representation on a jacquard tapestry of the activity of the artist over a period of three years. So you see the three oval shaped. And what, what do we see? We see many, many things. And when you get closer, you see even more. But we see, first of all, that it's beautiful and that even if you don't understand anything, you want to look at it because it's just a beautiful piece, but also that we have, uh, we can still see the presence of the actual day length that is longer in the summer 
three summers and short during the winter, and therefore that her activity was actually not as strong in the winters than it was in the summer. We also see a very strong asymmetry between her mornings, which were quite calm, and her evenings, which were quite active, and this is called the social jet lag, the fact that we are very active in the evening and have actually a lot of light. We also see that she sometimes works very early or late, that she travels or travels systematically in the spring where she changes her activity uh, very, very, very strongly. And if we go very close, we see her alarm clock. I mean, again, we see a lot of things just through uh, the lens of, of light and uh, activity um, over time. And the last um, installation I would like to uh, talk to you about is the one that I uh, happen to have developed uh, together with uh, colleagues in computer science and in an art and design school, which is called Circa Diem. And this one talks about our light hygiene in cities, in an urban context. And that, the, the, the idea here was to sort of immerse oneself into the, uh, an abstract version of an urban canyon, an extreme urban canyon, one where you would feel oppressed by the presence of the urban fabric and therefore disconnected from the sky and from the, the source of the day-night cycle. And so the abstract version of it was to create an immersive environment that was six meters high and in which you can sort of recognize this oppression from skyscrapers, so to speak, and uh, in which you will uh, live a day in seven minutes, through, through which it's kind of a meditating experience, through which you will hear sounds and see color change and, and see kind of time passing a, a bit more quickly than usual, but also where you can um, see images forming and unforming that all talk about our life in cities and our choices about our light hygiene, what we choose to do in the morning, noon, evening, and night, and whether this might affect us uh, as, um, in terms of our, uh, our light hygiene and therefore the, the benefits of light. Before I, I will launch a video which is a, an accelerated version of these seven minutes, only lasts one minute, but before that I just wanted you to be attentive to this blurry thing that you see at the top. This is actually an intermediate stage of the forming of an image through pure refraction. And this is why I uh, collaborated with um, my colleague in computer science uh, called uh, Mark Pauli. He invented a technology that by creating lenses where all there is, you know, uh, quote unquote, all there is, there is a curvature in the surface of the lens that redirects the light beams or the light rays in a way that can form an image. So it, there is no image engraved, there is no projector, it's just a light beam shining on a lens but the lens is able to recreate, to bend light to create some shape. So now I'm gonna uh, launch the, the video. And these images, of course, this is much slower uh, in, the, in the real experience. You can see these two images were representative of the morning. Now the, the kind of the sky brightens up the noise of the town, small town, uh, gets up as well. We are quickly going into the evening with other types of activities that may have different influence on your light hygiene. And then finally, we will get into the night with less noise, hopefully, and some crickets if you're very attentive. And so this is a way, or one of many ways in which I thought it was interesting to engage people in these aspects of the importance of light on us in architecture, in cities, and uh, just as living beings. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. so much for this amazing uh, lecture. It was uh, super interesting to see how you connected all these uh, different worlds together from like the super hard science to like uh, the very artistic stuff at the end. I think uh, Nora and I have a few questions uh, that maybe we'll just start and then we'll open up.
uh, to the audience and also to the YouTube comments online, so maybe uh, uh, yeah, for people who are not here. Um, I th have like a few questions. I'll, I'll start with something um, that I was thinking at the beginning of your, of your lecture. It was very interesting to see how you, you were focusing on very um, distinct, I think, architectural examples. Like a lot of it was like uh, uh, of the Pritzker Prize winners and I think spaces that we all uh, would love and enjoy. And I'm curious to think uh, or to, to ask you about how you think these kind of research uh, questions or like uh, findings that you uh, uh, saw in these like uh, really interesting spaces could be applied to like say the normal residential building of a neighborhood and of like a city. Very good question, and, and maybe I should clarify that the examples I showed, which are indeed all landmark architecture, everybody knows them. The whole point was that everybody knows them and they might have seen them or know what kind of atmosphere there was, but we didn't necessarily analyze them or apply the research to them. It was more to show how diverse ambiences can be, and these are good examples of how diverse they can be. If you show different residential apartments, it will be harder to be as, that it's as evident to see how diverse they can be. So uh, when we do research, we mostly do it in very simple environment, like shoebox environment, like things where we can control everything except the, the factor that we are interested in. Um, but then the, the extrapolation to the, any type of space, whether uh, super high-end architecture or, or more common space, is not necessarily the question because what we were interested in is the me mechanisms behind the effect, like understanding how it affects us or what factors matter. And then the question will be, do these factors apply in this or that environment? When, we, um, w when I think about the, the, our work with Oculite, what is true is that this kind of sophisticated investigation does not really make sense in, uh, in places where it's obvious how this will work. I mean, uh, everybody knows with a bigger window, you have bigger light. You don't need a simulation for that. So I think that in, uh, oftentimes, 90% of the answers, you have them with no simulation. But for the 20% remaining, you, you might, it might be helpful, for example, to take a decision between two options. And these two options are very complex. It can be a landmark building. It can be a, a different type of building. But if it's a reasonably large and reasonably intricate, uh, then you might not be able so easily to, to make these decisions. And this is where this kind of simulation or the Salamat type of simulation become really, really important to do. Um, so, so yeah, I, I may have given a wrong impression that we would focus on these. It was more to showcase uh, the difference in, in the lighting ambiences. Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. This was so wonderful and thought provoking. Um, there is a partial overlap in my questions, <laughs> but it's a two-part question. Um, I think it's really exciting uh, when you show all these parameters that are, um, or terms for capturing the different qualities of daylighting and that you, now you can measure them as well, or you know the sophistication of technology can match what we want to capture. Um, so my question is, especially with the, um, the work that you showed briefly on capturing dynamic views to the outside, um, w is there a future that we can, you know, A, like unify these standards and then also B, um, you know, communicate them to architects? Like I really appreciated, for instance, the demo that you showed. Um, but what about the dynamic qualities? And then the sort of second question to that is, um, as we scale these metrics to the ur urban environments, um, is there a way to capture like contextual variabilities? Like for instance, some contexts don't get those seasonal variations. Um, so is the some of your work, for instance, touch upon like how uh, those dynamic qualities scale to different contexts? So yeah, thank you. these are all great questions. And maybe to start by answering both, I would like to also uh, maybe clarify that I don't believe technology can capture everything that matters, like by far not. Uh, we are 
trying to get glimpses of it, and we should always be aware that the, it is much more complex than what we can measure. We're just trying to measure relevant factors that might, or maybe not, uh, have an impact in the response that we have. It is always much more complex than what we can measure. Um, so now going back to the two questions that I almost already forgot. Um, so the first was about the... Standards, like unifying, yes. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in relation to design of the dynamic qualities and the metrics that are coming out to measure them. Yeah, so that was the, uh, in relation to the views? Yes, or the views. Yeah, so th this uh, work is actually trying to, indeed, I mean, you have not so much choice usually in the views that you have. And so uh, the, this, the work that we're currently doing is more targeting how to properly uh, conduct research on views to not overlook a very important factor, which might be that the views change. So that is one of the question. But in terms of the factors that matter, um, there is also the question of trying to understand better what might be what we love in sunlight coming through leaves. So the, the work by Stella that some of you maybe have met, um, is focusing on komorebi. This is a Japanese word for sun coming through leaves with these pinhole effects and so on. And okay, it's fascinating, we love it, we like to see them. And as scientists, we are trying to now extract from something we love, try to extract uh, little ingredients of what might be most impactful in loving it. I, 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 I'm slightly uneasy to say because it's as if I were removing all the beauty and all the mystery. But we are trying to see w if we can see which is it the movement, is it the intensity distribution, is, the, is it the composition, is it the temporal frequency. All these might matter together or maybe some might matter more. And once we have a better understanding of what might matter and we will do image processing with that and um, we are working with uh, signal processing experts at EPFL for that, we might try to try to get this into uh, an object like a shading system that, for example, in the case of bad views, let's say, uh, or, or views that are not so uh, desirable, to enhance them by working on the shading that they create rather than on, uh, and so therefore protecting from the sun, but also by sort of enhancing what, what we are seeing by bringing this natural aspect to it. So this is the, the, what is going on. The real test will be to have real people facing this for real and then uh, looking at whether this uh, actually makes a difference. And in terms of the geographical and contextual aspect that you were, was also in your, your other question, um, we have been looking, uh, for example, at geographical differences in terms of expectations. So when we worked in, uh, uh, in Norway versus Switzerland versus Greece, our expectation was that we were working on patterns for that was that people would uh, crave sunlight in Norway and maybe reject it more in Greece and that in Switzerland it would be half and half. Uh, and no, this is not what we found. We didn't find such a strong uh, geographical uh, sort of bias in, in the responses. So, uh, and then the other question is, yes, we evolved under a day-night cycle and we evolved mostly in the equatorial region a long time ago and therefore we are not so used to these very strong difference in day lengths that uh, happen in higher latitudes and so all of these are, are um, questions that we, we should ask ourselves and, and effects that we can see are important and therefore to better understand what is really happening is a, a quest that we are pursuing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I feel like one thing your, your research clearly shows is that we have to move away from this very like static evaluation that maybe was a few years ago kind of the, the standard of like how, how you would like see oh like just like in maybe measure just broadly in like a kilowatt hour or just like average lux or like whatever and I think kind of like use more these like dynamic methods that maybe also engage how users like interact with spaces and like because then only like can we know how the light actually impacts that and I'm wondering in like the 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 buildings that you showed, like especially the office buildings, like how um, do you, how do you envision this maybe in the future to like interact with kind of uh, like architects or what kind of like new types of like uh, metrics would would you need to actually like capture these these things? Yeah, I 
I feel very strongly, but I might be wrong, that it would be a bad idea to try to bring all this together into a single indicator or metric that says this is good, this is bad. And the whole point of keeping them separate, at least the three pillars that I mentioned, but there are other pillars, of course, that we can always add, I think there is a beauty and a necessity to keep them separate. And yes, that means we have to make a decision that is not a clear number, and that's part of the, the, the interest, actually, <laughs> of the decision, is to then work with the priorities exactly like we do in a design process in general. As architects, we always have to work with all these, uh, I mean, I've, I'm a physicist by training, but I some have been in, in architecture long enough to try to speak also uh, that, that language. Um, and this syn synthesis effort, this way of weighing these different priorities and giving more weight to certain and over others, the only thing that these tools or metrics are helping is by getting them to be more informed, that the decisions are more informed because you know a little bit more about all these different dimensions. But ultimately, it is still uh, a very complex uh, question to solve, and the, the choice of priorities is still a moving target. We can open it up. Yeah, we would have two mics, yeah, and uh, we can do the two sides at once. <laughs> Hey, Marilyn, thank you so much for the beautiful talk and welcome back. Uh, so nice to have you here. Um, yes, we do know and love Stella very much, so thank you for showing us <laughs> her work. I, I think a lot of us are, are familiar with some of the previous work she did, and it's really exciting to see. Um, something I asked her a lot, and I, I'm intrigued by what you just said uh, about the motion and how that, the, the motion of, of, of the movement of, of sort of these patterns of light that we observe in nature and, and how we might perceive them um, as humans. Uh, you know, coming from a structural engineering perspective, I always feel that there's something about the fundamental frequencies of trees and branches that relate to the material properties and cross-sections of branches that give very specific patterns of movement that um, I, you know, I always think about when I see these tree branches blowing in the wind and sort of, like, the, uh, the other thing I think of a lot is music and the sort of dynamism of music and patterns of, um, rhythm that, that maybe have similar ways of being characterized. Like, do you see those, like, have you thought about incorporating that sort of way of thinking about the motion in your work, or is that how the signal processing is kind of going, or what, what do you So think? this is exactly how we are going, are starting to uh, address it indeed, and um, a, a finding that uh, Stella found very early on in her literature survey was to look into Japanese literature, which means that you have to understand Japanese, <laughs> but, um, and to realize that there was a lot of work on the 1 over F frequency, and that this seemed to have some magic to it about naturalness, and so this is uh, something that we are exploring indeed. But uh, we, uh, we didn't stop there or don't want to stop there, so we, we want to look at indeed this different dynamism that we find in leaves and actually her latest um, uh, capturing of images before she gave birth she's now a mom, um, is, uh, was looking at different types of trees and that how the type of tree and the type and the, the, the leaf, the stem of the leaf, would uh, impact the type of movement of the leaf and to try to uh, uh, translate that into a model of some kind and then to, to go closer to, to, to still stick to the, uh, this slightly unpredictable and yet describable um, features of tree movement. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your great presentation today. So my question is, you know, we already know a lot about the daylighting and there are a lot of instruments to just measure the daylighting aspect of the study. My question is about the physio physiological side of the study and how you just measure the impact specifically of the daylighting on the, for example, the participant in your study. And for example, you show different patterns for the windows and you mentioned the different heart, r heart rate and how you like can understand the it is just the, the exact impact of daylighting on the heart rate I mean there are not so other variables I mean in the physiological study that might interact with each other and impact the study and the result 
Very good question. Yes, this is a, it's a difficult quest, and we refrain from doing invasive physiological measurements like uh, saliva or blood samples or, or whatever. We do non-invasive stuff, and these, the biomarkers that we use usually include either all or, or some of heart rate variability measured with an Empatica bracelet, um, skin conductance and or skin temperature, and uh, I would say these three are the main physiological markers that we use, plus PVT, uh, psycho vigilance, uh, psychomotor vigilance tests, which are reactivity tests, very easy, it's like an app, and you have to, you calculate how much time it takes you to realize there was a change in your screen, and so this tells something about your alertness, and, and uh, so, so these different factors together tell something about arousal and alertness, but none of them is uh, a, a ground truth. They all somehow relate, and so then the, the, the real um, attention, uh, real attention has to be put to try to limit what has changed between condition A and condition B, either group A and group B or condition A and condition B uh, in, in for the same person, the between subject versus within subject design. Um, we have to be, pay close attention to control that the rest has not changed. And so, uh, for example, when we did the heart rate variability uh, and then the heart rate that I showed you, the, the numbers, of course, if you have an athlete and then you have someone who's stressed because he has an exam tomorrow, you will have a very different heart rate. So the first thing you do in any case is to take a baseline. So we, for all the, the participants in this particular case, we had them experience a same, it's, it so happens to be artificially lit scene that they could see. We would measure their heart rate. The athletes had a very slow heart rate. The others had a very, and then we would look at the difference with the heart rate that they had when they were looking at these other images. So this is an absolute necessity. The other absolute necessity is to randomize, to not do things in the same order because otherwise there is a, either a learning effect or a bias. And so, we, so all these uh, uh, tricks that are part of a proper experimental protocol, of course we apply, but as we work with daylight, there is, it can be some variability, but we usually do things under clear sky so that there is not the cloud cover change and in short amount of time so that the sun doesn't move too much. So all these things um, matter that the temperature is maintained in a certain rate, and et cetera. So, but these are not easy to do experiments. Uh, and we know that there is a limit uh, to what the physiology markers can tell us, but still it's useful to bring them and confront them to the responses of the participants. We always also, also ask questions and then we see when they match, it's a bit more reassuring than when they say the opposite. Thank you, hi. Um, uh, at one point in the presentation, you were showing us, uh, you know, reaching the threshold of one for a healthy dose of light, per, or? Uh, yeah, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Healthy dose of light is reached. My question was just, um, is that, was that more of a, like, a qualitative or a quantitative, like, you know, a quantitative thing about certain health outcomes or qualitative, like, you're gonna feel good people say they feel good after reaching that, or it's both, or what's? A great question and great opportunity for me to clarify. This was not a healthy dose threshold. This was only the, um, the line that said when melanopsin-induced response, so when it's okay. weighted by the melanopsin sensitivity to light, is the same as the photopic sensitivity to light. So it's only when the ratio was one. It was not more than that, so just when Basically, when you are exposed to daylight, the two will match because melanopsin is melanopic equivalent for daylight. So, of course, if it's daylight, it is one. Uh, and so, in, in some cases, you would have slightly different. But in a way, yes, I still drew that line as an indicator to show how close you are to daylight. And ab above daylight means that you just have more blue than, than daylight, so it's blue and rich, but okay. Um, that was the only purpose. However, um, standards like well, they do say there is a threshold of equivalent melanopic lux, and they say that you have to achieve that for a certain number of hours in a certain uh, time of day. And so they have decided, even if the research is not totally mature, but it takes so long to be mature that it's good to start to raise awareness about these aspects, so then there is a threshold. And then the question is, okay, is equivalent melanopic lux 
good enough to tell us something about health. And this is where uh, we actually developed a, a model quite a few years ago to try to extract lab findings into a model that was more dynamic than equivalent melanopic lux, that was cumulative and accounted for spectrum, which seemed to uh, replicate lab results quite well. We are uh, going to publish about it soon. And uh, so, so, yeah, it's a, it's a moving target. And those types of models or actual outcomes come from neuroscientists who did find um, uh, actual impact on health or some indicator uh, or some proxy, let's say. Yeah, so it's a long journey. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> Thank you. I, I loved the presentation, especially the last part, the artwork, you know, uh, touched me at the core, makes me want to dance in moonlight. <laughs> uh, and this is why I'm asking more of a blasphemous question, because you told me this afternoon, uh, we have to ask the hard question. So we look at some research, right? We know it's now better to grow plants uh, underground with electric lighting, and the produce that we get from that is arguably even better than when we grow on Earth. Uh, you showed these images and these trends that in a world of 8 billion people, we go, we are cramped together, it's tighter and tighter. Then there's this interesting work from Joe Paradisio and Nan Zhao at the Media Lab that when we show images and views, our brain can't distinguish between a real view and a fake view. And you probably know where this is going. So. And my son only wants to look at a computer screen and not even at a book. So is the future not maybe that all of this work will be applied, but we're going to use basically LED lightings to create it all and it's all a myth? Great, yes. Let's look forward to that. No, it's, um, it, this is a great question, actually. Um, I thought you were going to ask... Uh, shouldn't we just live outside and we are done and we should stop our research, which is also a good question. <laughs> but, um, I mean, maybe, but as human beings, uh, we actually have evolved to be social animals, to have interactions with other real interactions. When we meet somebody, and I'm not talking about light here, but when we meet somebody and we have a meeting on Zoom versus in person, it is different. I mean, I don't see, see anyone who would disagree that meeting someone in person is, even if we say the same words, but we won't say the same words, and we won't feel the same thing, and we won't be energized the same way. So to think that the future that awaits us is a future in the metaverse without any connection to the tangible physical world is a yeah, dystopia we can discuss. Um, and to replace everything that we crave and have evolved with views out, connection to season, connection to the outside, with screens, is for me a little bit replicating what I said at the very beginning of the talk. This technology can make us get rid of what we can't control, and we are better off in control, and every time we tried to do that, we were wrong. So I, I don't want to dismiss it, but it's more like I don't hope I have no hope that this will bring a better civilization or, or condition as human beings. Yeah. So whether it's useful to go into this level of detail when all we need is maybe keep this connection, maybe in 300,000 years when we will have evolved, continue to evolve <laughs> under the metaverse, maybe we can rediscuss what we really need, but our needs today are still anchored in these times, I guess. and. Um, and whether we can differentiate a virtual image from a real image instantaneously, I would like to first conduct research to see whether the effect of continuously being exposed to screens in the long run is also the same or not. I think it just seems to be a tendency, and I think it's worthwhile taking seriously. It's also, uh, I mean, fortunately, the Mango Hall complex has been canned that you showed. Uh, you, you see Santa Barbara. I didn't know that the, the yeah, news it's, were it's officially now. Done, done. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank God. Uh, <laughs> but we could generate places, maybe in other environments, where the pressure of real estate is just high. 
plus uh, so many of our colleagues that want to go to Mars, so maybe we have to take that technology with us. Uh, it's just interesting to see because all your research could be one-to-one -one applied. In a way, this research would help. Yeah. Your research kind of helps to have an Earth on Mars. <laughs> okay, I'll do something else. <laughs> No, but it, it, it's, it's a real question. It's also a real question what we are uh, aiming for as civilization. I think the advent of AI is another big uh, question that also questions our um, condition as, as human being and as a society and how this will impact us, not just our jobs, but also our sense of purpose and why we have a purpose in life. So these are big, big questions indeed. And uh, yeah, w whether to know better what we need will be the driving force of getting us to only live on Mars or in a virtual world. If it gets to that point, I will maybe change gears. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this great talk. Um, do you think there is a um, potential in energy savings by playing with the brightness of light and the color of light as you presented? If you feel a bit warmer, in a redder light, do you think we could just save some energy by putting it a bit colder? <laughs> no, absolutely. This was, of course, uh, some of the thinking that came after we discovered that there was an effect that was st statistically significant. But I have to um, dampen the enthusiasm a bit because this effect, as I said, and I should repeat it, is very small. And full disclosure, it is smaller than the effect of gender. So the fact that uh, statistically uh, uh, female or, or women tend to feel uh, colder than men in the same, same environment is actually a stronger effect than the effect of color. So we should be careful not to try to solve everything with that. What still I think is interesting, first of all, is that there is a connection between the two in how we feel and therefore that our response to our environment is one whole, is not one thing at a time. I think this is one lesson learned. And the other is that, yes, as it may affect us, it could, in certain circumstances, be interesting to look at thermostat applications or, or, or this or that. But then we would have to um, look into less extreme environments. These were quite extremely colored environment, a little bit like the architecture pieces that I showed. It was not run in them, it was run in our dear shoebox model, uh, shoebox space, but yeah, so to see if they still apply to a, an extent that can make a difference for thermostat. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yes. Oh, Mar <coughs> Marilyn, this wonderful talk, and, and uh, I want to, um, to put together, your, there are two forms of, of dynamics you were talking about, both where you were showing images changing with time in a given space, and then the sensor that people could wear to get the spectral content as, 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 as a, a stream of data over their activities um, in, in, the, uh, in the day. And I'm thinking about with an application to, to design and, and whether some of what you're talking about is not so much controlling the visual environment at a particular place or even a bill of rights that says you should be within so many meters of a window, which is probably more the case in Europe than, than in the States, but, but whether buildings can, can provide uh, um, a variety of, of, of visual and maybe thermal experiences as a function of how we move around in them. Um, and I, I think the application, you've done some nice work for the MIT group in Singapore that I was a, a part of some years ago. Very much appreciated that. But, you know, the sealed boxes or these canyons you showed from the outside give you no visual variety. Uh, the windows are tended to control thermal properties. And so on a cloudy day, that's not very good for us, you know, visually. Um, and I think there have been some thermal comfort studies that show that people will seek out a sky garden uh, even say Southeast China where it's hot and humid, just for the, vis the thermal delight. They're outside for a few minutes. They wouldn't want to spend hours out there. And I'm wondering whether you think the same sort of thing can apply from a lighting perspective where our buildings are designed as you move around in the course of day or you have options to do that where, where you can control your, your, uh, your exposure to different, uh, you know, uh, different um, um, 
wavelengths of, uh, of light. So you not only get a thermal experience, but if you're outside on the sky garden, the spectrum is different. I mean, the color spectrum is different, and, and it's just, it affects various senses, but can help. So um, we're stay, uh, stairwells here, I think, work well because there are light in it. So if you're going up and down, you're getting an experience that, that, that you don't get using an elevator or an interior, that sort of thing, where the, the architecture is static, but that it is meant to promote dynamics and how we use it. And I think this is exactly how we might want to think about architecture or design as uh, to bring in the intent also to be conducive to a behavior that might be good for you. So if you have a design that kind of naturally brings you through the program, through the uh, layout, through what comes before what in how you lay things out, and you have the time and the luxury to be able to also think about that when you design a building or renovate one, to have a building that by itself, by its architecture and program and layout, and maybe furniture, helps you behave in a way that is good for you, I think would be a very interesting uh, quest to try to uh, stick to uh, by bringing the experience also as a, as a sort of incentive to, to, to behave in a way that is good for you. And the other uh, would be to better understand where what happens or what and exactly the, the, the example you said in, in Singapore or, or in these thermal delight uh, spaces, what exactly is happening? Is it the contrast to a non-comfortable indoor environment? Can we make that more comfortable? Or is it actually a good thing that people do get outside? Because if they do get outside, they get exercise and they get a much stronger light dose by going outside. So maybe this is a good thing that they feel like they want to go outside. So I think this behavior plus uh, design or light distribution, static light distribution combined with the behavior in it could be a marriage that could be even tighter by having the design help you behave in a way that is good for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just heard we have time for one more question. Yes. Hi, thank you for your talk. It was very inspiring and interesting. Um, I had a talk, I'm sorry, a question about like tolerances and like adaptation um, that you've seen. So, um, you know, you talked about like circadian rhythm and what's considered like normal for a person, but then you um, have also done studies in sort of like warehouse environments. Um, so I was curious for like people who maybe work in those environments, um, do they um, kind of have different tolerances to like the contrast and light? Um, or like, you know, when you talk about thermal comfort, for example, if people who live in hotter climates are maybe more tolerant to like certain temperatures, for example, like have you, I don't know, like done any work um, in that area? So we, we have not necessarily done work focused on that, but we have observed over and over how much inter-individual variability there is. And this is on thermal comfort, this is on visual comfort. We are still trying to find out why people disagree so much on glare. And so we are, have been investigating eye morphology, uh, answers or um, with uh, macular pigmentation density or uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the distribution of light in your sphere, uh, in your field of views, all of these, why do we disagree so much? And, uh, and so this inter-individual variability is, I guess, part of who we are in terms of circadian rhythms. Again, in average, we tend to have um, a standard, bi well, our own biological day slightly longer than 24 hours, and so we need, we absolutely need the light in the morning to shorten it so that it fits 24 hours, the astronomical day. So we need that to shorten. Some of us, maybe not, it's, it's, a, it's a minority, but some of us actually have a slightly shorter day naturally without light. And so then uh, to shorten it even more would, would be a bad, but this is the exception. The reason we, we might have all experienced why we are rather the second, the first type with a slightly longer day is that we usually have a harder time traveling east than traveling west. And this is, the reason is that we are already a little uh, more than 24 hours and traveling west, you have to extend it, you know, uh, dramatically more and therefore we, we can do that a little more easily. So these inter-individual variability is very, very present in all aspects, uh, which is why 
we always have to take things with a grain of salt, that it's, this is only statistics, this is only a finding that applies to you know, the, some community. Also, at universities, we tend to use or to um, have access to participants that are in a certain age group of a certain educational background. They're all rather young. Yeah? And so this means that we have to go uh, a bit beyond uh, comfort <laughs> in terms of uh, research um, uh, protocols. To We have started to work in elderly care homes, but this is, of course, more complicated. You have fewer participants. So yeah, this is, these are all uh, very important uh, aspects. But the observation is that clearly we are different. Now, if you think about a building, yes, we are different, but a building is not a personalized or not easily personalizable object. We still are a community living in, so I don't think it is absurd to try to work with uh, findings that apply to a group rather than a person. Yeah, thank you. Great, uh, we're being told that our time is coming to an end, our beautiful time together. Uh, let's please help me thanking Marilyn for uh, a fabulous presentation and being bringing your science and science in general to the public. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And plus, if you want more, thanks everybody for coming um, to this evening. Uh, thank you for the faculty and staff and students who make all of this happen. It only seems so smoothly because we have all the great help from our staff. Again, if you want more, we hope that you will join us next Thursday with uh, Jill Retson, uh, uh, who is hosted by Computation. Uh, if you want to see a full list of upcoming events, go to architecture.mit.edu or act.mit.edu. Thanks a lot. See you next time.